Developing now, the CDC unveils fresh recommendations amid the evolving COVID landscape. We're going to talk about what the changes mean for you and your family, plus breaking down stigmas and building support. We'll talk about the importance of prioritizing mental health to build stronger rural communities. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, is Dr. Jeffrey Gold the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight, he's brought another wonderful guest for us. Dr. Brandi Clark will join us. She serves as the director of psychology at the Monroe Meyer Institute at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Gold, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a lot to cover, a lot of ground to cover tonight. Where would you like to begin? Well, thank you, Christina, and good evening, and uh, happy Monday night to uh, all of our audience. Uh, as usual, uh, let's do a little bit of a refresh on the COVID data, and then I want to focus laser head on on uh, exactly what the new CDC recommendations are, why they are, and, and what scientific basis uh, they're connected to. So as always, we start off with the hospitalization rates uh, across the U.S., and as you can see, uh, we're at 4,986. Now, that is significant because it has been months and months and months since we've been below 5,000 daily hospitalizations. Now, not by much, by 14 people, but nonetheless, uh, this is the first time we've been below 5,000, frankly, in just about as long as I can remember, or at about 1.5 per 100,000. Delaware, Missouri, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, anywhere from about two and a half to as much as in Delaware, five times uh, the U.S. average. But again, very, very small numbers and continually moving uh, in the right directions. You know, when we look at some of the trend lines uh, on this, uh, you can see that uh, even going back to the very beginning of the pandemic, but particularly for the last several months since the winter holidays, uh, we are looking at a continuing fall off uh, in the total number of hospitalizations. When we go to the 14-day uh, uh, running average chart here, you can see that over the last 14 days, we're down another 8%. So absolutely, uh, the weather is getting warmer, more people are getting out, uh, and indeed hospitalization is falling. Uh, it is falling in the, those that are over 70 years of age. Uh, it's relatively flat in the 60 to 69. And in the under 60, uh, it's relatively flat also. And the reason being there is that it's mostly affecting those that are immunocompromised and less related to their age and more to their medications and their other medical illnesses that they may be uh, facing. You know, when we look at the changes that occur in the variant types, what I'd want to point out to you, we're still predominantly a JN1 nation. That's the bright purple bars uh, looking at the nowcast models. But I would like to point out for the first time to our audience the existence of something called JN1.13 and JN1.18. Together, these comprise about 5% of the total infections in the United States. They are just starting to appear uh, in our country. They have been seen in other parts of the world. And when we look at the limited data uh, from across the country, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how the trends change for individual variants. I called out to you the uh, mid-Atlantic part of the United States, region number two, which tends to show the most of that reddish purplish color, not the dark purple, which is JN1, but these other subtypes that are now starting to increase in frequency. And, you know, and what that means is that these newer subtypes actually do have a competitive advantage, uh, at least as it relates to transmission. And there's no evidence to support the fact that they are any more or less severe than the other subtypes that we've seen. But we are starting to see the numbers grow, and that's something we'll continue to share with our, our audience. We haven't seen very much of that in other parts of the country just yet. You know, when we look at wastewater surveillance, uh, the numbers are still uh, extremely uh, good. 
uh, just over uh, 1,240 sites reporting in our country. And the very highest performance uh, sites, meaning the highest number of uh, viral particles in the 80 to 100 percent range are down 4 percent. In the 60 to 79 percent range are down 12 percent. And in the 0 to 19 percent range, they're up 18 percent. So again, by the total number of sites, things are moving in the right direction. But I would call your attention uh, to the southeast, uh, to the mid-Atlantic, uh, and again to the Great Lakes region where most of this data come from. And it demonstrates that there are still areas of amber, orange, and bright red uh, indicating uh, that this is not completely behind us. And, and as our audience knows, the wastewater numbers are pretty good predictors of what we're going to see with total viral infections and hospitalizations in the week to come. So this is a trend line looking at overall wastewater numbers. We look at this every week. And you can see in the last several weeks, the wastewater numbers after the holiday, this is just a year's worth of data, uh, have gone down. They're not as low uh, as they were four and five months ago, but they are coming into the right direction, but a little bit slower than I would have liked to have seen for this time of the year. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that just to make sure that some of these newer subtypes <clears throat> that we're seeing uh, as demonstrated in patients are not also influencing the wastewater numbers and our predictors of yet another spike, something uh, to keep a really uh, close, uh, close eye on. You know, when we look at COVID mortality uh, week over week, going back to the summer of uh, 2020, hard to believe we've been tracking it that carefully ever since, the trends are all uh, moving in the correct direction. Indeed, week over week, uh, we're seeing fewer and fewer Americans losing their life. And indeed, the overall uh, mortality rates are still under uh, 1.2 million Americans in the United States. And hopefully, we'll never get uh, quite to that mark if we can continue to take uh, healthy uh, precautions. You know, when we look at the overall number of weekly deaths, we're at uh, 2,423. And these are confirmed deaths. Uh, some of them may be weeks ago or even more than that. Uh, Kentucky was about twice that in the weekly reporting. Uh, New Hampshire, one and a half times that, roughly. But again, extremely small numbers. Uh, when we look at the aggregated uh, mortality rates from uh, influenza, uh, COVID, and other respiratory infections from the National Center for Health Statistics, Mortality, and Surveillance, yeah. while the spike uh, at the far right of that chart continues to come down, it is starting to plateau a bit. And whether that's a reporting uh, uh, anecdotal feature or whether it's actually a change in the number of deaths due to respiratory viral infections remains to be seen. So again, that's something that we are going to keep a very close eye on going forward. So as you said, Christina, uh, the last week, late last week, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provided some updates in an attempt to simplify the respiratory viral recommendations. So what I'd like to do with the next few graphics with our audience is to begin to unpack that. And I'm sure we'll have some questions from our audience uh, as to what this all really means. So uh, last week, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released updated recommendations. And these are directly from the CDC websites. And they point out that this new guidance brings a truly unified approach to addressing the risks from a wide range of respiratory illnesses, which include COVID, flu, RSV, uh, and so many others that we know about today and others that we may see in the future. And they're based upon three uh, basic principles. First is staying up to date uh, with vaccination to protect people against serious illness, hospitalization, and death. The second is practicing good hygiene, which means covering cough and sneezes, washing, sanitizing hands, cleaning surfaces that are touched frequently. And then finally, uh, taking steps for cleaner air, such as bringing in more fresh air from the outside, purifying indoor air, uh, focusing more on outdoor gatherings. These are all logical, common sense steps. And indeed, if I were to characterize uh, these recommendations, I would characterize them as common sense. And they're based upon these three uh, 
items. First, that hospitalization and deaths are decreasing despite some periodic surges in COVID-19, and I would add to that flu, RSV, and other viral infections. Secondly, we all know this to be the case, we've proven this over and over again, is that the risks of these infections continue to be higher for older adults, they're higher for infants, and for people with pre-existing medical conditions. And then the final uh, point that they base all of these recommendations on is that prevention and treatment for COVID uh, remains a public health priority as it is for all respiratory infections. And indeed, long before any of us ever heard of COVID, we were still dealing with significant hospitalization due to flu, due to RSV, and due to other viral respiratory uh, infections. So what are the recommendations? I would just draw your attention to these words from the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and they say that when people, you and I, get sick from a respiratory viral infection, the updated guidance recommends that we stay home and away from others when we're sick. You know, common sense. Uh, that people with COVID, the flu, uh, and RSV uh, have treatments that are available. And we can lessen the symptoms, lower the risk of severe illness, hospitalization and death. And then what's different here is the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, recommendations include returning to normal activities, meaning go to school, go to work, go shopping, go out with your friends, uh, at least 24 hours after the symptoms are overall improved. And if there was fever that was present during the time of this illness, it is gone without using any fever-reducing medications. They go on to say that individuals should take additional precautions, again, common-sense precautions, for the next five days to curb disease spread, such as cleaner air, more hand hygiene, perhaps wearing a well-fitting mask if you're with others, particularly those that are at high risk, uh, keeping distance as best you can, and if, when necessary, uh, to get tested uh, for which of the respiratory viruses uh, that you may have been exposed to. And then they go on to say that enhanced precautions are especially important to protect those that are most risk for severe illness, including those over 65 and those that have weakened uh, immune systems. So these are all areas we've talked about on this broadcast literally for years. And what they're really doing is creating a common sense guide to all respiratory infections. And it makes no difference how old you are. It makes no difference uh, what your overall medical status is. Uh, this is really a common sense approach. And so I just thought I would share some of the science that has gone into this. So I'll introduce a new word to our audience, at least one that I haven't shared on this broadcast, uh, called seroprevalence. And what seroprevalence means is a fancy word for having antibodies to a specific disease. So in this case, this is a map of the United States looking at the level of antibodies in adults, that is to say those over 19 years of age, uh, by states in this country. And so based upon this study, now this study is about two years old, but it gives you an idea, and it's only gotten better since then, is that at that time, 57.7% uh, of the adults uh, had antibodies that were measurable uh, against COVID. And this was at a time that we were at about 186 million uh, confirmed infections. And the total number of cases uh, reported uh, by the end of this, uh, based on the sampling, was about 78 million uh, individuals. And when you look at the breakdown uh, by age and by sex, uh, you can see that in the top part of this graph of that 57.7%, uh, those that were uh, youngest uh, had about an 80% seroprevalence. Those that were oldest, those that were more than 65 years of age, uh, had a much lower seroprevalence, about 30%. So there is an age-related phenomenon of building antibodies and retaining antibodies uh, to COVID. <clears throat> And then when you look at it broken down by sex, you can see they're almost identical and that women had a slightly higher seroprevalence in this whole group uh, at about 60%. Uh, 
compared to about 55 or 57 percent for adult uh, men. Now, if you look at the kiddos, you get a somewhat different picture. During the same period of time, about 96 percent of the children, uh, based upon 65 million uh, infections uh, in the United States uh, in kiddos, under 19 years of age, so quite a big uh, sampling size. And other than the three or four states that did not, uh, were not able to report data, you can see that there's a very homogeneous distribution of seroprevalence of child antibodies to COVID across the United States. And when you break that down specifically by different age groups, it's a much tighter distribution. Because you can see in the zero to four uh, year age group, uh, you're talking about 90 percent presence of measurable antibodies. By the time you get into the 12 to 17 age group, you're talking about almost 100 percent. And we know that because of the spread of the infection in young people, their relative uh, resilience uh, to the infection. Again, a slightly uh, ad larger advantage for women about almost 100 percent versus about 95 or 97 percent for the male components of our kiddos uh, under, uh, uh, under 17 years of age. And so all of this adds up to the fact that there's a tremendous amount of memory, amnestic uh, immune response to the COVID virus. It's, you know, in a sense, it's almost what we used to refer to as herd immunity. Unfortunately, it doesn't last forever. And unfortunately, with new variants, become slightly less effective. But between being immunized uh, and having ha been infected, the prevalence of antibodies is extremely high uh, in the United States, and particularly uh, as it's in the younger population of those uh, under 17. So again, coming back to the CDC recommendations, which are based upon all of these factors, you know, when you're sick or when you're with others that are high risk and you think you may have a respiratory infection, wear a mask and ask them to do the same thing. Practice social distancing, avoid crowds, get vaccines, and when available, uh, if you're ill enough, stay in contact with your local health care providers uh, and get some of the new medications that are available and have been shown to be so effective against these viral infections. So in summary, uh, we want to be aware of the new guidelines for flu, RSV, and COVID for both prevention and care. As always, communicate with your local health care professionals, public health officials regarding prevention symptoms and care. You know, the CDC does put a great big asterisk on all these recommendations, saying we may change them depending on patterns of transmission, hospitalization, and other such things. Always consider the care and caring for yourself, but also we need to be very aware of the care and caring for others. You know, if you're getting over a respiratory infection, we all know that's not the time to visit your grandparents or parents in a long-term care facility. That's not the time to visit somebody who's hospitalized, uh, you know, recovering uh, from a cancer or major surgery. As always, vaccines and treatments are very effective. And I guess what I would sum it all up by saying is that common sense and reasonable caution in preventing spread is important. Uh, common sense uh, really has to drive all of these things. And, you know, we all have the tools now to do the right thing at the right time. So as always, spread the word, wash, rinse, and repeat. So back to you, Christina. I very much look forward to uh, Introducing Dr. Clark back to our audience. It's been several years since we've had the opportunity for her to join us. And mostly, I look forward to interacting with our audience this evening. Absolutely. I mean, there's a mental health shortage in rural America, health care shortage. We need more good doctors just like you across the board. So we're going to have that discussion tonight. We want to make sure that you get involved in our conversation. I want to give you the number. It's 877 731 Six seven three three. Go ahead and grab a pen. I'll give it to you one more time. We've got it up on the screen right there for you. Eight seven 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 three one six seven three three. Doctor Gold, just going back to those guidelines for a moment. Did they surprise you, or the timing of their release? Anything in there that caught you off guard? You know, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, Christina, for the last, I would say, year uh, regarding when to 
bring all of these respiratory infection guidelines together. You know, we've seen surges in flu. We've seen surges uh, in RSV, particularly in children, filling our children's hospitals. We've been up and down in COVID numbers. Uh, so, you know, uh, hard to say what prompted uh, the reports out at this time. Uh, I think the guidelines are reasonable, uh, but they're all based upon the fact that we have good vaccines and we have good treatments, which means that our audience uh, and, you know, those across uh, rural and urban America uh, need to have, a, you know, a reasonable amount of common sense to protect themselves, to protect their loved ones and their families and to protect others. I mean, all of it's based upon that common sense approach. If that is lost for any reason, uh, this is going to be a very, very hard transition to move forward with. And then the next booster shot that becomes available, it sounds like it's going to become available in the fall, which really isn't that far off from now. Is this something that we are going to have to repeatedly do seasonally or yearly? Do we have any sort of guiding light as to how this is going to go down the line, how often we're going to have to get boosted? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, I hear the same thing that the next sequence is going to be available sometime late summer, early fall. Uh, I also know that there's vaccine development that's ongoing, interestingly, not only for COVID, but for uh, influenza, for flu as well. That could be a sort of a one and done sequence rather than an annual type of sequence. So it's unclear which will be available this fall. But, you know, one of the really good things, uh, you know, one of the few uh, r remarkably good things that came out of this pandemic is a better understanding about how to manufacture very specific vaccines to get them produced in a short period of time and get them into the arms uh, of Americans in rural and in urban areas. And as part of that technology, we've learned more, perhaps, about how to make vaccines that will be effective across large series of cohorts of these viruses. You think about it, you know, I've been getting an annual flu shot for as long as I can remember. To get one and done on that, the same way we do, particularly like with measles and mumps and rubella and diphtheria and tet tetanus, you know, uh, granted this once or twice a lifetime booster may be needed or if there's a major change in the virus itself, but to get to that stage would be a major technical advantage, I think. And think about the time and effort that goes in to all of the scheduling, the logistics, et cetera, and the inconvenience, let alone, you know, getting jabbed in the arm. So uh, uh, I'm pretty optimistic. I'm guessing the uh, fall sequence will be much more like the previous variant-specific sequence, and we'll see where we are, you know, uh, very late spring, early summer, in terms of what the specific variants are out there. We probably will uh, have more combinations with flu uh, vaccine, which I think would also be another convenience for people and possibly a good incentive uh, to get the boost. Okay. Well, navigating this novel virus has been tricky. We're so grateful that we've had you to kind of guide us along the whole way through, like you pointed out, 2020 is when we started tracking numbers. We're now in 2024, still tracking those numbers, still trying to determine when exactly we are going to get the next booster and when the next after that is coming down the pike. So thank you for keeping us straight, Dr. Gold. This is your opportunity. Do you have a question for Dr. Gold? Go ahead and call in and ask tonight, 877-731-6733. We're going to pause for a quick break. We're going to spend some time to focus on mental health. So get your mental health questions in order as well. We have an expert coming your way right after this quick break. Again, that number is 877-731-6733. We'll be right back with Dr. Brandy Clark next. Over 13 million Americans were affected by identity theft in 2022, and the threats go way beyond just credit card fraud. Today's identity thieves can use your information in ways that are easy to miss by just monitoring accounts and credit, like opening loans, transferring home titles, even committing crimes. Someone got my social security number, made a driver's license, and was used for criminal activity. You can do so much with a social security number that I didn't know could happen. They drained my bank account. It was terrifying. You're even more vulnerable than you realize. Your information is exposed through online shopping, banking, even corporate data breaches. No wonder there's a new victim of identity theft every three seconds. 
Only LifeLock alerts you to the widest volume of threats all in one place, like someone trying to use your social security number, open a new loan in your name, or even commit a crime in your name. There was a big yes button and there was a big no button. I clicked, that's not me, and LifeLock took it from there. If you become a victim of identity theft, a dedicated U.S.-based restoration specialist will be assigned to your case and work to fix the issue on your behalf. If something happens, you have somebody fighting for you. All LifeLock members are backed by the LifeLock Million Dollar Protection Package, including reimbursement for stolen funds, personal expenses, and coverage for lawyers and experts up to $1 million. It can be dangerously easy to steal your identity. With LifeLock, it's easy to help protect yourself. I will be with LifeLock forever. Join the millions of people already protected by LifeLock. And for a limited time, save 25% on your first year with promo code 25TV. All plans include a 60-day money-back guarantee. Call 800-710-6842 or visit lifelock.com slash 25TV to save 25% on your first year of identity theft protection. Enroll now. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome tonight's special guest. Not her first time on the show. This is Dr. Brandy Clark, Director of Psychology at the Monroe Meyer Institute at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. She received her doctorate in school psychology in 2007 from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and she completed her clinical internship and postdoctoral training in integrated behavioral health care. Dr. Clark's clinical and research interests focus on integrating behavioral health services into primary care and school settings. So important. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Clark. We're thrilled to have you with us. And let's just start with one of the toughest questions that's out there right now, because we know the answer to it is just how bad is it? Talk about the mental health care shortage in rural America and why it's proven to be so challenging to address it. Let me first start by saying thank you for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to be here and to talk about something that I feel very passionate about. And I think you're hitting that challenge right on the head by saying there, it, one of the reasons why there's such a challenge in rural America is there just aren't enough of us to go around, period. And so when you look at where our clusters of providers may be, we, we tend to see more, more and more folks on our coastal regions. The further inland we get, the, the more we spread out, there aren't enough of us to cover the areas that are needed. And so that's one of the biggest factors that we face is that we just, we just need more providers. At, at the end of the day, we need, there need to be more of us, more of us in training programs, more of us in a variety of, of different programs, master's level, PhDs, psychiatry. We need more providers to meet the needs. We need more providers in schools, which is something that you're working toward, yes. and I love that. And in primary care, what are some of the dangers of living in an underserved behavioral health area? I, I think it's important to recognize that our mental health and our physical health go hand in hand. You cannot separate the two. And it's just as dangerous as it would be to live without physical health care. It, it's the, you have the same dangers of living without behavioral health care. It can be life threatening. And, and, and that's not to, meant to be uh, sounding too alarming. But at the end of the day, it's it's true. And I think actually Chancellor Gold could speak very well to what chronic stresses can do to your uh, heart and that can our physical conditions. In our rural communities, that's a pretty common condition that we see. Our farmers and our ranchers experiencing a lot of chronic stress. It, it's a hard job, it's a hard lifestyle. And that stress over time can have a big impact. And it, it really, I, I can't stress that enough that it's, it's critical to our health and our well-being that we're getting access to the supports we need. Yeah, I think a lot of us don't really make that connection that stress can actually really impact your overall health. We think of, you know, contracting a virus. We know that's going to impact our health in the long run. Our immune system has to fight it. What, though, Dr. Gold, if you can elaborate on that a little bit, how does stress impact our cardiovascular system? <clears throat> well, Christina... <clears throat> Excuse me. 
We've learned uh, over the years, <clears throat> gosh, a bit hoarse, we've learned over the years that uh, stress <clears throat> uh, and many other factors, uh, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, tobacco, all go hand in hand as risk factors for cardiovascular disease, for heart disease and for stroke. And unfortunately, uh, with changes due to not just COVID, but some of the economic changes in our community, the aging of the population, the workload of our farmers and ranchers, we are unfortunately at a time that the stress levels are high <clears throat> and the chronic disease levels are also quite high as well. And so anything that we can do to reduce the stress is a really, really important thing. And as Dr. Clark says, there is no question that stress levels go hand in hand with cardiovascular disease, meaning heart attacks uh, and with strokes. And that's really where the behavioral health workforce becomes so critical because there's really good treatment available for just like for medical diseases, for behavioral health diseases, uh, be it in the counseling area or be it in the medication areas as well. And we'll unpack that a little bit with Dr. Clark in a few minutes, I'm sure. But it's not like we're talking about making a diagnosis and saying, you know, goodbye and good luck. It's just the opposite. It's about getting people engaged in very productive care so that they can be more functional and at the same time lower their risk for heart disease and for stroke. Okay, excellently put, and thank you. You're such a trooper. Dr. Gold has not missed a show since we started Rural Health Matters, and you can see we watch you every week. You push through even when it gets challenging to make sure that we have the critically important information that we need. So thank you, Dr. Gold. Russ from New York joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Russ. Go right ahead. Thanks, Christina. You are so charming, and you look like you're ready to go out to the na nightclubs in Nashville after the show. <laughs> um, you know, mm -hmm. Dr. Cole, I, have a little water. I want to ask you two questions because you're the numbers guy. But it, doc, Dr., uh, Dr. Clark, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Cole said the CDC guidelines now call for indefinite social distancing to prevent infection and it, indefinitely. And I know there's a lot of open spaces out there in Nebraska. But here in New York, it's a little closer. And I'm wondering, Dr. Clark, do you think there's inherent stress? Is there a scientific basis? Is there neurotogenic effects from, from these kind of uh, things we're told? And one other thing I'd like to bring up, since you are a school psychologist, uh, um, the, the effects on school children and special ed was devastating. And, you know, Dr. Gold's a very thoughtful person, and he's a real mensch. And I often ask him to reflect on the cost benefits of this hypervigilant response we had. Uh, I understood just the other day, we had 500 excess alcohol deaths a day during the height of the pandemic. And, you know, we have a governor here who, in New York who wants to let everyone take uh, liquor to go. So there are a lot of crazy people around, and I just want to know, one, two things from Dr. Go real quick, I'm sorry. Two questions. Is the effectiveness of the vaccine, I know we were told in the past the annual flu vaccine was 40% effective. Is that considered effective now? And Dr. Gold, 1.2 million cumulative deaths, is that a 1.1 uh, mortality rate? And how does that compare to what we were told to expect? Sorry for all the questions. Thank you very much. Well, Russ, it's great to hear from you, and thank you for calling in. And uh, let me clarify one or two points, and then we can ask uh, Dr. Clark, if she will, to comment on what the impact of some of the pandemic precautions were uh, on school children, because that's really her area of uh, expertise, and we know that the impact is very real. So the CDC recommendations around appropriate distancing really uh, are not about large group gatherings or restaurants or theaters, athletic events, schools, etc., as they were during the peak years of the pandemic. The way I interpret it is if you or I uh, were to get uh, COVID or, for that matter, the flu or any other respiratory viral infection, they would expect, I would expect, that you or I would not go into large groups of people, particularly indoors, where we would be running the risk of spreading that infection. And we would certainly stay away from groups of people that were more vulnerable, such as in hospitals, uh, outpatient facilities, uh, long-term care facilities, and things uh, such as that nature. So that is, Russ, uh, a substantial shift. Uh, the overall mortality rates of just under uh, 1.2 million Americans 
uh, are substantial. And, uh, and they are roughly what was projected. Uh, you know, fortunately now, with uh, good serial prevalence, as we've talked about a few minutes ago, uh, and with reasonable precautions, common sense, as I like to call it, uh, hopefully we're not going to see those numbers uh, continue to rise because we've got good vaccines and we've got very good uh, antiviral therapies. Plus, we do, you know, what is not spoken of many times is that we do a really good job in our hospitals now. We've learned an awful lot about how to keep people off ventilators, of the importance of what's called prone positioning to enhance lung function. And so we get even our oldest and sickest patients out of the hospital with a much greater degree of reliability, which continues to drive down the mortality rates. The only questions, of course, are whether we're going to see another variant or another subtype that is not only more transmissible but more virulent. And, and that's pretty much a roll of the dice. But as the overall numbers fall, the number of transmissions fall, the number of mutations are going to continue to fall, and therefore we're going to be relatively better and better protected from a new super variant. Not, it'll never go to zero, but it'll get better and better. So what I'd like to do is turn it over to Dr. Clark, and uh, maybe, Brandy, you could say a few words about what your thoughts are on the effects of the pandemic in schools, particularly in the K-12 uh, educational environment or even in the pre-K uh, environment, and what we learned from it and perhaps uh, where we're going in the future. Yeah, I, th I think there's no doubt that the pandemic was pretty impactful. It was pretty stressful. It just was pretty disruptive to routines. It was disruptive to uh, expectations that, that uh, many, there was a lot of loss experienced for many of our children, for our adults, um, some in terms of loss of life, but also just loss of graduations, birthdays, social events that they experienced that uh, um, uh, Im impact a lot of our well being. And so as we now recover, as we come back from the pandemic, as we regain some of that sense of normalcy and predictability, we definitely do see that there was an impact. We do see higher rates of anxiety in particular across the board at all ages. We do see that for some, one of the biggest things is that for those who maybe had more difficulties with learning or difficulties adjusting to social um, conditions, they, they're having a harder time coming back and regaining um, some of the lost learning, regaining some of those lost um, interactions and having to start, start with those again. So we're identifying more and more students who need some of those supports and catching up again and getting back on track. Um, the majority of us have recovered. The majority of us are getting back to those routines, are finding those supports again, but we do, we do see it definitely had an impact. Really, really fascinating to hear you break it down that way, because I think we all figured that this was going to happen, but to actually have research to prove that it was happening, and after the fact, kids are still trying to recover, is profound. I think that um, it's something that we're all going to have to recover from from a long time. We're still just digesting the fact that we were in the middle of a pandemic just a couple years ago. And we're slowly easing out of it. Lauren from Minnesota joins us now. Thanks so much for joining us, Lauren. Go right ahead. Uh, Dr. Gold, uh, my question is this. I've six, I'm 79 years old, and I started getting the COVID shots in 2000. And so I've had seven of them following every spring and every fall. As I understand now, people over 65, we should get another booster this spring. Well, thank you for calling, uh, Lauren. And, and let me just uh, make a few comments. Uh, I'll answer your question in just a second. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the vaccines serve several important purposes. One is to prevent infection uh, of any type. And that has to do with the specificity of the vaccine for the subtype and the variant of the virus that you're preventing against. The other effect, though, is to reduce the severity of illness. And that means preventing hospitalization, shortening time that people are out of work or out of school, and, of course, are preventing the ultimate tragedy, which is death uh, due to the uh, infection. And so uh, every year, let's talk about influenza, depending upon the ability to predict 
the strain of influenza that we're going to see in the United States, which is largely based upon what happens in South America uh, during the previous uh, summer, because it's a fall-winter infection for us. It's a fall-winter infection in the Southern Hemisphere as well. So that's what we use to make some of the predictions from. We're accurate anywhere from about 50 percent prevention uh, to maybe 75 per, in a really good year. We might hit the high 70s uh, or even 80 percent uh, infection. But the reduction of severity is really critically important because we don't want to have people miss work. We don't want our kiddos to miss school. And we certainly don't want to fill our hospital beds with individuals who have the flu. So the same thing is true about COVID as well. And so the vaccine efficacy rates due to time since your last uh, uh, booster, uh, due to changes in the variant subtype, uh, due to the fact that our immune systems, uh, you know, don't carry high viral titers, uh, uh, antibody titers forever. Our amnestic systems, our cellular immune systems carry it far longer, but our overall antibody levels do fall over a period of time. That's just normal human immune system function. The older you are, the faster those numbers tend to fall down. And so we still have good efficacy in prevention of severe infection prevention of hospitalization. And as the death rates continue to fall, they're reflective of that seroprevalence, largely due to vaccine and the combination of being infected at least once, if not more than that. So coming back to your specific question, uh, the timing of an individual's vaccine cycles is largely dependent upon how old they are, whether or not they have other diseases, uh, such as weakness of their immune system, whether they're being treated for cancer, whether they're on other drugs such as high dose steroids, whether they're transplant patients, etc. And depending upon that and the strength or the weakness of your immune system, uh, that would be the determination of how frequently uh, one ought to get boosted. Certainly no more frequently than every six months and no more frequently than 90 to 120 days after a COVID infection. But I'll tell you is the same thing I would tell any member of my family who asked that question. And by the way, they do ask that question rather frequently. As I say, call up your primary care physician, the person who either prescribes your medication, does your annual physical, et cetera, and ask them what they think they would do, what their recommendation is for you, because uh, we're all different. Excellent. Thank you so much for that call, Lauren. We appreciate it. Debbie from Kentucky joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Debbie. Go right ahead. Hello. Um, hi. I just um, wanted to tell you my experiences. Yes, please do. And um, um, during, you know, the COVID outbreak and everything, and um, I just felt, you know, kind of suspicious of what was going on, and. I got to looking up, you know, on um, in Kentucky specifically about doctors, and it was this was not a conspiracy theory website or anything. This was before, and it talked about doctors buying up hydroxychloroquine, and um, I knew several people that got COVID that were tested and sent home. No treatment whatsoever. They wound up in the hospital. I had a cousin, her husband and her got COVID, very sick, went to the hospital and went home. And I was around a lot of people that had COVID. I was taking some antiviral, um, quercetin, different things. Of course, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. I'm 68, but I am healthy. And my family, my daughter's family, got COVID. They were all treated by a nurse practitioner with uh, um, a breathing treatments, um, um, uh, hydroxychloroquine, um, and the other one. I'm not can't think of it right now. Um, and being treated was very important. And doctors were either not allowed, this PA that was doing this for us 
did not even want doctors to know, did not want to be because he was afraid he could get in trouble. So, um, you know, I was around it a lot, uh, never got it. Like I say, I took the um, treatment that my acupuncturist actually told me. And um, so I feel like the whole pandemic thing, like, you know, was made so much worse by the restrictions to being treated quickly and um, just to, I feel like a lot of it was for control. I have an uncle who had all the vaccines. His eye doc, he had to get um, an eye surgery. And the eye surgeon told him, do not get this last vaccine because it's going to ruin your immune system. He got the shot, and two weeks later, he got pneumonia, and he passed away the next week. I know several people that's got the shot that wound up dying, and of heart, not to say they didn't have other conditions. And then young men, it's readily known young men and men having heart problems from the shot. So I feel like that you're kind of given a false narrative and then wanting children to take this shot. I'm just, you know, I'm sorry, but that's, I just wanted to give, you know, my experiences. Well, Debbie, thank you so much for calling. And of course, you never need to apologize for sharing your experiences and asking good questions and asking hard questions. And all we can do on this broadcast, and frankly, all I feel ethically and morally obligated to do is, is share with our audience what scientific studies show. And, you know, we've administered hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines in the United States and clearly ha have saved countless lives. It's not to say they're perfect and it's not to say there aren't individuals that have reactions to the vaccines. But overall, if you look at the number of serious reactions, and the number of individuals that not only were successfully vaccinated, but survived uh, serious and near life threatening uh, cases of COVID or RSV or flu or other types of pneumonia, the odds, scientific odds were, were huge. You know, and as far as the hydroxychloroquine questions were concerned, there again have been any number of large scientific studies that looked at it in early COVID, <clears throat> mid-stage COVID, severe COVID, hospitalized COVID in terms of preventing uh, illness, in terms of shortening length of illness, shortening length of hospitalization, preventing death, etc. It was tried in low doses, moderate doses, high doses, with other drugs, without other drugs. And there's, the studies have just been quite conclusive from both a safety perspective and an efficacy perspective that there was really not a benefit. Now, it's not to say that there aren't anecdotal experiences, because the long and the short of it is, even if you look at what we call placebo-controlled trials, that is to say individuals who are administered placebos, who are randomized against active therapy, you can still see significant improvement because our body's natural immune system, <clears throat> excuse me, will fight off these infections and continue to get better and better in fighting them off, because that's how our immune systems work. But, you know, there's ongoing science in many of these areas. And one of the really nice things about the science, at least to me, is that it continues to change. That's the nature of scientific discovery. What we believe to be true today may not be true uh, tomorrow or in many years. You know, I think about, you know, back in the days that I went to medical school and was a surgical house officer, and, you know, you might say that's when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. It could certainly be true. But the things that I learned, the drugs that I was taught to prescribe, the thinking about causes of diseases have changed tremendously over the years for the better. So we now prescribe better medications. We understand diseases better. The surgical procedures that I learned to do have largely been made safer and better or replaced by other more uh, effective procedures. And that's what science does. And, and that's why it's so important uh, to be able to understand where the science is today. You know, hopefully <clears throat> this will be the last pandemic of this precaution, of this performance that we will ever see in the United States. Uh, 
basic evidence says that is not the case, and that we're likely to see more uh, similar things uh, in the future. And hopefully we'll just get better and better at doing it. But, you know, just coming back to your original premise, never feel badly about calling and asking these types of questions and expressing uh, your own experiences. We all learn from each other that way. Absolutely. And you are amongst friends at this table. And this is how myths are dispelled. This is how truths are revealed through conversation. So thank you for that question. We appreciate it. Joe, we're going to get to you on the other side of this break. So stick around. We still have time for your call as well. 877-731-6733. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters right after this. At Granger, we know dealing with the unexpected is part of your job description. And you made a promise to keep the line running, to power through the downpour, to be the one who always gets it done. And our promise is to help you do it with professional-grade supplies for every industry, plus same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. Because you can't predict the future, but with the right partner, you can be prepared for it. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. On the next Wood Songs, Larry and Joe merge the music of Venezuela and, believe it or not, Appalachia. Sister Lala is classically trained very much in the spirit of the great and legendary Odetta. Now Mary had a golden chain, every link spelling Jesus' name. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. The best in pro rodeo are headed to the heart of the Lone Star State this March. Get a front row seat to real Texas grit during Rodeo Austin. Austin, Texas, are you ready to rodeo? The big money, momentum, and matchups make Rodeo Austin a big impact on the PRCA's regular season. From the first round to the final bull, watch it all starting March 9th, right here on the Cowboy Channel and streaming on Cowboy Channel Plus. That's a great way to kick it off. Many of my clients ask me, how can I afford to buy my next home, but also make sure my current home sells? That's why who you work with matters. With Homelight, we're able to help clients buy and sell at the same time with all of the certainty and none of the stress. It's the most game-changing solution in real estate today. Together with Homelight, we've helped clients win the home of their dreams every time. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We are glad that you're with us. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. And I want to talk a little bit about rural health care providers because we saw one obvious tool really grow in popularity. That was telehealth during the COVID pandemic. But Dr. Clark, rules have loosened up. That was one of the indirect benefits. Now more people are capable of using telehealth for services that they couldn't before. Talk about what's changed there now that the height of the pandemic has passed. Yeah, I think if there was one uh, silver lining in terms of the pandemic and things learned, it is that telehealth is an invaluable tool. And my hope is that we learned that lesson well enough that it will never go away. I can speak as a provider who used telehealth throughout the, the pandemic. I found that I myself was more accessible. My patients were more accessible to me. I was no longer limited by being in one clinic in a day. I could be in multiple places throughout the day. I also got better access to understanding what the day is like for patients that I was serving, where they live, what they're doing, what's accessible to them, and how to make better recommendations in that way. I think it was it was a pretty invaluable tool for a lot of us in just creating accessibility for behavioral health. So there's definitely advantages for behavioral telehealth. Do you see any drawbacks? Yeah, so I mean, some of the limitations are when you're providing telehealth from a distance, it's hard to understand resources in, within communities. And I'll be honest, a lot of things that I do in terms of recommendations are are connected to other resources. They're not and they're not in isolation. So if I'm not familiar and I'm providing uh, uh, recommendations to somebody who's in a community that I'm not familiar with, it can be a little challenging in that way. 
It also presents some real limitations that we learned that, you know, we were uh, pretty limited in the ways that we could do evaluations, testing. I'll give autism evaluations as an example. Those are not things that we can do via telehealth. Those actually were pretty limited even doing them in, with masks um, because a lot of the uh, evaluations require interactions with in, in person. So there, there are some things we learned that really don't work well uh, via telehealth, but a lot more possibilities than we were aware of. Uh, you know what's great is that UNMC, this is, this is no new area for you because over 40 years ago in the 1980s, UNMC and MMI pioneered a concept called the Integrated Mental Health Home. Now, 40 years later, it's come so far. Explain the vision behind it and how the concept has evolved. Yeah, you know, we, we really had some true pioneers that, that uh, worked at the Monroe Meyer Institute and had this vision for creating access to behavioral health care. Dr. Joseph Evans was one of those and a great mentor of mine that understood that if we were going to be better providers, we needed to go where people were instead of expecting them to come to us. And we had a lot more uh, people were accessing primary care doctors at a, a much higher rates than they were ever accessing behavioral health providers. So if we wanted to be accessible, we need to fit, needed to figure out how we became part of the primary care system. And so integrating ourselves into, the, into that system of care, becoming team members, made us more accessible just by limiting some of the barriers, some of the um, system barriers. But it also helped to reduce a lot of the stigma around what it was to access behavioral health care and just um, create a space where we become part of what's normalized care and talked about as part of the whole health system. So folks were more trusting of us as providers and more trusting of the care we provided. It's just brilliant. Um, I think it's, it's a model that, that everybody should be following, really, because our mental health is, is part of our well-being. It's so important. Thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. I want to give you an opportunity to share your final thoughts with us, Dr. Clark. I think one of the things as we've talked about today is just understanding that mental health, behavioral health, and physical health are very interconnected. We really don't separate them. And, and we've learned that it can be life alter altering and critical that we need to treat our minds and our bodies as all being part of one big system. Absolutely. And it does take a team of connected providers to really address our, our well-being uh, in uh, cardiologists and folks like Dr. Gold, behavioral health providers like myself, school psychologists in our school systems. We are all part of one big team that addresses well-being. I love it. And, and I love what you're doing at UNMC. You're setting the example. You set the bar high. I want to thank you so much for doing this show with us each and every Monday. Dr. Gold, thank you so much for joining us as well. See you next week right here.